Indigenous fruit and vegetables, there was a slide on that. Um, most of the indigenous vegetables are relatively more nutrient dense than most of the uh, global vegetables. For the last 50 years, plant breeders have been removing the nutrition from global vegetables. Uh, that's unfortunate, but ABRDC is providing parental material with high nutrient status, so it's up to the breeders to take advantage of that. Um, there's a big conference uh, in our August this year, the International Society of Horticultural Science in Brisbane. Uh, AVRDC is running a workshop on indigenous vegetables. I've just completed the keynote paper for that. So everything you wanted to know about indigenous vegetables at a global level, what we're afraid to ask, is coming out. Uh, and I'm happy to provide advanced copies if anybody's interested in that. Um, it is an important issue. And if you're dealing with indigenous vegetables which are not well researched, you certainly don't want too many in your um, portfolio. You want to be able to farm well. And this is a knowledge intensive exercise. Growing rice, in truth, is relatively simple compared to most other crops. Everybody knows how to do it. It's well tried and tested. But if you're now going to grow Malabar spinach or African uh, eggplant, there are things that we don't know very much about. You now need to learn how to learn, grow those things properly, because otherwise you may make mistakes and be wiped away. Uh, and I certainly don't want that to happen. But on the other hand, if you have a single crop enterprise uh, and you in fact throw in two or three additional vegetables or fruit crops, then it makes a lot of sense, because then you're starting to have resilience in your farming system in case there's a drought or in case there's cold or flood or whatever, you have something because not all of those crops will be killed under those circumstances. Charlotte, and then... Yeah. Oh, might yeah. Help. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to first start with the question about what to do with markets and building on the example our colleague from Concern said. I think that raises, of course, the challenge of markets, and Bonnie can respond better to that. But also, it can be an invitation for us to think of multiple strategies. And for example, where, where there are issues of shelf life uh, and transport, how about things like microgardens? Um, and I can think of examples in the Canem in Chad, where uh, women uh, were helped to establish very small gardens. And there's a lot of innovation in that sense, which can make production possible, even in areas where normal agricultural production is not, is not available. And it's much easier to distribute seeds or a potato sack or whatever. Um, and I think it raises the issue of, you know, again, diversity of strategies and maybe that as a factor uh, of resilience. Um, another interesting point I'd like to build on, and Bonnie has illustrated that very well with her presentation, is maybe this issue of nutrition is an, an, an invitation to reverse our planning thinking. In agriculture, a lot of the planning is around what am I producing or what can I produce on this soil, where shall I sell it, and who then can buy it. Whereas with nutrition, we have to start with the question, what does the consumer need? Then where does the consumer get that? What can I do in terms of enhancing market access or production and so on? And we have an issue right now that consumer demand is, is manipulated, so to speak, by very aggressive uh, advertising. A colleague from China was saying how women you know, sell their eggs to buy Coca-Cola. And on the other hand, manipulated by the supply. So we need to reverse the system thinking how can it be driven by consumer needs. Um, and and that goes back to this question of how do we generate incentives for that. And there's a lot of thinking in terms of how funding streams for you know, development work, but also in government uh, allocations to what, how can we create an enabling environment where agriculture has an incentive in being nutrition sensitive and environmentally sustainable. Not an easy question. Funny. <laughs> you guys have the answer. More questions. I guess, I guess the first thing I'd like to address is this idea of who's trusted. Who's the trusted voice within the household for nutrition? Mm -hmm. And it's very important to understand where mothers are getting their knowledge base. And the community health care worker has been extremely successful in Kenya in delivering nutritious messages as well as Ethiopia, as you're saying. Um, I think there's some innovations where community health care workers can't get because agriculture does touch very remote people. So how do we use the agricultural system as a delivery mechanism 
for either nutrition-specific interventions or nutrition-sensitive. Can we deliver nutrition-specific interventions that we know work, micronutrient powders, lipid-based nutrient supplements, at maize mills? Right? Because maybe community health workers aren't getting there. So I think we can be quite creative in trying to bring those and use the touch points of agriculture for nutrition. So that's one idea. I do want to address the post-harvest loss and pre preservation questions. Um, you know, this study that we did directly looked at, um, at food preservation within the household because that's the woman's role in the household. This woman is also, Mercy is also in charge of food preservation for the household. And there's a lot of entry points for better nutrition that wouldn't typically be seen as either agriculture or specifically nutrition. Um, these FES and OptiFood analyses really help us get at that, both in urban and rural settings. So in urban settings, for example, we conducted focused ethnographic surveys of mothers. There was a company, a complementary food company, that wasn't fortifying. And Gain was saying, you need to fortify that complementary food because the diet is inadequate for children under two. And so the, the private sector um, said, you know, that would be fine, but it's going to cost me more money, right? That, that product is going to be slightly more expensive. So what would, it, what would get a mother to spend one more cetus on my product if it's fortified? So we went in and did the focused ethnographic studies. And the key thing that would have her purchase that food was making it instant. Women's time famine is a huge trigger for better nutrition. The same is true in rural areas. We found that if you could introduce cook stoves, now you would never think of cook stoves as a nutrition intervention, but cook stoves give her time. They give her far more time. She doesn't need to collect as much firewood. She has much more time to feed her children adequately. So we do have to think pretty creatively about what are these triggers for better feeding practices. That's great. I'm going to go back to Dana for a quick post-harvest comment and then on to John. Mm -hmm. Post-harvest loss is the big thing that we have to deal with. About 40% of all vegetables are probably lost between production and consumption. Um, but if you're thinking about nutrition now, you can choose your indigenous vegetable quite carefully so that you may in fact be able to then ration this out over a much longer period. So in the Sahel, for example, Vitamin C is not a problem when mangoes are in season, but they're only for two weeks of the year. Okay, now, but hibiscus sapdorifa, roselle, sorrel, is an excellent source of vitamin C. It can be preserved as drinks or as uh, chewable sweets, these types of things, that can in fact be harvested and issued by a family over a year so that children can have vitamin C all the year round. So you can make choices of your indigenous vegetables on those sorts of grounds. Good. Yeah, so let me just uh, touch on a couple of the points uh, mentioned, um, but also to um, make one additional point that occurred to me after while people were talking, um, which is uh, um, the, the question of how we make sure we're making progress uh, um, on, on climate smart agriculture in ways that don't diminish the progress that we've been making in, um, in delivering more nutritious foods to people, growing and delivering more nutritious foods for people. Um, and and uh, in that regard, one important uh, commitment was made by uh, the um, members of the CGIAR uh, Consortium of Agricultural Research Centers, which was to include biofortification in future uh, um, crop development, um, which means, so biofortification means uh, 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 crop varieties that are bred to be more nutritionally dense in, in some regard. Some one or more micronutrients is enhanced as compared to the, the average variety of that, of that uh, plant. So for example, it means, uh, Dino, sorry, can I say orange flesh sweet potatoes um, as one example uh, um, to improve uh, beta carotene and therefore vitamin A availability. Um, it, uh, it includes iron, high iron beans, um, which uh, help with anemia and, and so on. And so the commitment is that uh, future crop varieties will be biofortified. So that means if Simit is producing a drought or heat tolerant wheat variety, they're going to have to be thinking about how to include some nutritional enhancement in that, in that plant. And by the way, uh, um, uh, biofortified crops can, can be developed with uh, genetic engineering, but um, by and large the varieties that are in use now are, are bred through conventional means. So uh, I just say that because some people hear biofortification and they think biotechnology, i.e. genetically modified organisms. 
Um, on on a couple of the points raised in, in the comments, uh, um, on markets and post-harvest losses, for me, there's a link there, which is that if there are good market linkages, um, farmers will have an incentive to move their goods to market, um, sometimes uh, in, in periods of, of uh, you know, the immediate post-harvest period when, uh, the, the, when the prices fall, as there's a, um, a, um, an overabundance of, of the crop. Um, it may just seem to be not quite worth it to get all the crops to market. Um, uh, and so things like warehouse receipt systems, which give farmers the ability to park their produce, get a, a receipt that they can then uh, use as collateral for finance and so on, so they can get access to some, some, mo some money uh, while they wait for the market uh, um, price to, to stabilize and sell at a more advantageous time, these sorts of measures are, are ways of helping uh, make markets operate in ways that are better for the, for the farmers. Um, commodities exchanges here in Ethiopia, there's an Ethiopian commodities exchange that's underway, uh, which the U.S. has um, uh, helped facilitate, as has the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. These sorts of measures help farmers get better access to uh, regional and glo global prices for their, for their products. Um, and so these sorts of measures also should help reduce um, post-harvest losses because, again, it makes it more worth it for the farmers and, and intermediaries in the system to take advantage of markets. Um, on the spigots and buckets uh, point, uh, the idea that uh, uh, funding tends to be uh, um, narrowly focused on one or another priority and uh, people who want to adopt integrated approaches are therefore disadvantaged. Um, I, I know that uh, in the U.S. government this is something that we tried to be increasingly attentive to. Um, as one example, USAID um, will be releasing next week uh, an agency-wide nutrition strategy. So this means that it will look at the work being done through the global health programs, through the Feed the Future agricultural development programs, um, through Food for Peace, the, 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 the emergency response side of the, the house, food aid side of the house, um, and bring all of these strands and any others uh, going on in the agency um, together under one strategic approach. And that should help. It should mean that as new uh, um, projects are, are designed, um, that they will uh, uh, recognize those linkages. Feed the Future has tried to do this um, by making sure that our, um, our agricultural interventions include thought about nutrition linkages or about uh, uh, climate resilience linkages and so on. And so um, uh, we, we are uh, wide open to I input as to how we're doing, but we're trying is, is the point on that. Thanks.